Are you sure you should have had David I can't on? help but playing the fart noises during the song. Hello and welcome to Game Brain. I am your host, Matthew Robinson. This is a board gaming podcast about our gaming group. And today, the board games are being set aside. Games that need boards. Those ridiculous notions. Today, we are talking about card games. Specifically, trick-taking games as the large genre we are going to be exploring today. Joining me on this podcast, we've got our newest host. We've got Jordan. Hello. Remind me, you are the uh, experience gamer. That's right. Or experiential gamer. Either way. And of course, the wonderful, as always, Dimitri, the philosophical gamer. Welcome, Dimitri. This is your host, Tom Donnelly, and I will be doing this accent for the duration of the episode. <laughs> I know how much you love my accent. This is a, a long, Especially the ethnic ones. This is like inside <laughs> job, but you have to figure out who is Tom and who is Dimitri by the end of the episode. And we have a special guest today as well. That's right. This is a four-person Game Brain episode. We have the infamous friend of the show, David Gillison, finally joining us. Welcome, David Gillison. Thank you. I guess I didn't even know you guys had a podcast. That's so fascinating. <laughs> well, you are only the friend of the podcast. You right. don't exist as your own person with agency. You are friend of the show, right. David Gillison. We have talked about David Gillison more than any other human being who has never been on the show outside of maybe Reiner Knizia and Uwe <laughs> Rosenberg. And so it is a pleasure to have you on here today, David. Now, you are always the person who has come to game night with a bag of small little boxes that never get played. That's right. And those would be called trick takers. And you've brought them for years and years, and you're always bringing them out, and it always causes us to sort of go, okay, yeah, we'll get to that if we have a little chance. Yeah. But we, 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 have, we have disrespected you and your trick takers <laughs> for years. Very true. And now... I have fallen in love with trick takers. Many in our group have been enjoying this ride that I've brought you all on, I hope. And now we are doing an entire episode dedicated to the wonderful world of trick takers. Thanks to David Gillison and also oh. Jordan, who you both got me into it. It happened one night, like three months ago, when you brought out shamans at the end of a game night. And I was super into it and found it really exciting. Yeah. And we also, I mean, we talked about a bunch of other games at, this, at that time, too. Um, but I'm like Paul and I play the long game. You know, and so you did. I was just working on it, working on it. And I knew somehow you'd come around. So. I've become absolutely obsessed with trick takers in the last couple months. Um, it has kind of fully taken over my game brain in the way that I'd say only 18xx as a genre has in the past. Um, and I'm really excited. And that's a And well, no, I just meant in terms of like a genre of game that has like 18xx as a whole world. Right. As a genre of games, the reason, the main reason we didn't play a lot of t trick takers before uh, is because they are short. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, and most we, of them are half an hour, forty-five yeah. minutes. Some of them even shorter. Um, and there are some people at Game Brain, yes. uh, particularly those who host Game Night, uh, who say, "No, no, no, no. We should get to the meteor games." No, that's me. I have been the anti-filler gamer for years and years because my gaming time is so limited, and the games we play are so long, and I get so few opportunities to play games that I have poo-pooed the short games for a long time because I didn't want it to interfere with my, you know, quote unquote, you know, real, real course, full course meal of an actual four hour game. Dimitri, though, you have long been a champion of the trick takers. And that was why I'm so glad you're here today, because your favorite game of all time falls under the category of a trick taker, although we, we, we were arguing about this moments ago, whether it is or not. But your favorite game of all time is Teach You, which definitely exists in this category and in the world of trick taking games is one of the considered one of the best and the most beloved of all games. I, I played 1500 or more games of it, uh, most on BGA. Uh, uh, and it, 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 it's a compulsive game for me, uh, like Tetris used to be or Collapse used to be. Mm. I can like picture uh, Hands of Tichu in my mind uh, when I go to sleep. So it's not a healthy relationship. <laughs> well, uh, my very first game I ever learned uh, was a trick taker. Um, my, my grandmother uh, taught it to me uh, in Russia. It's called Durak. Uh, I taught it to you guys very badly. <laughs> uh, I think I totally we know who the Durak screwed was. it up. Uh, no, but, by the end of it, I fully got it and it was able yeah, to Yeah, it, it. it's a trick taker played with a regular deck. Um, and uh, it kind of like a, set my mentality. Uh, you, you know, I think the first game you play kind of creates expectations and almost creates a craving 
Mm. Um, and I like trick takers with uh, complicated rules, but not like forecasting. Mm. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, I, I'm so glad that you're here because you have so much experience with trick taking games and card games. And, and again, your favorites are that. So it's going to be interesting to hear because now, now we've opened up the floodgates and you've played a ton of trick takers over the last few weeks. And I'm very curious to hear how you feel they compare to teach you, where teach you still stands amongst them, et cetera, et cetera. So let me just give you a broad overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So today, in essence, is going to be a primer. I know there's a lot of our listeners who I was one of until recently who knows very little about this genre who hasn't really dived into the world of Japanese card games and trick takers and shedders and climbers. And we're going to get into all of that. I'm going to tell you, we're going to give you sort of our experience with them, our favorites. We're going to give you our top three. Each of us has a top three trick taking game that we're going to be telling you about. We're going to tell you about how you actually get these games of which that is a game unto itself. Cause these are often very hard to get, must be imported from other countries, typically Japan. Um, I'm going to talk you through that. I'm going to talk you through, the actual places where you can get uh, lots of information about these, other podcasts, other channels, things like that. Because it is an exciting whole world that we are just sort of dipping our toe into here at Game Brain. And I want to, you know, I don't want to uh, pretend that we are the experts here. There are others who have really planted a flag in this genre for a long time. And, and I appreciate all that they have taught me about it in the last few months. And I will give you the little I know and see if it uh, sparks a joy that it has sparked for me in giving you a new rabbit hole to dive down into in this lovely hobby. Let's start, though, by defining these terms. What are trick takers? What are shedders and climbers? What, are, what defines this genre? So we actually yes. were arguing about yeah, this Yeah, we earlier, had a big battle about this. And it, it can be a contentious thing. But I think uh, there are basically, we, we can call the whole thing trick takers. We can just say that's the genre of these games. And it, most people wouldn't argue with you unless they have hundreds of trick takers like many of the people who are very into this hobby do. And then they start getting broken down into categories. So then there's trick takers and there's often what's, they usually go together. They're very rarely separate, but shedders and climbers. Right. So what does that typically mean? And I'll give you some examples of them. So let's start with trick takers. Trick takers are usually things where everybody plays one card. Everybody has a hand of cards. You must usually follow a suit. So if I play a, a heart, if you have a heart in your hand, you must play it. There are often trumps, which are things that are higher than the suit being played. You usually can't play a card unless somebody has either led with it or you are out of that suit, and then you can play anything you want often. And you're often collecting these tricks and putting them in front of you in some sort of a winning pile or a score pile. Sometimes the cards within those piles will matter. Sometimes the amount of piles of cards you have will matter. Things like that. Those are sort of the basic tenets of trick taking. Does anybody want to add to that? Right, and leading off of that. So once you've won that distinct, let's call it hand, uh, the, you know, uh, round, you as the lead who have won that are leading the next trick. So that you, that in essence makes it so that it has this flow of of winning and and then leading in that way. I think that is the broadest and. Uh, way of thinking about right and so much like an 18xx which everybody you know who, who loves 18xx knows the basic tenets there's a stock round there's an operating round there's obviously trains involved there's a map there's tiles there are certain things that are always going to be present what makes the genre interesting is how people put their spin on it so often the basic rules of what wouldn't consider an 18xx or a trick taker the joy in discovering new versions is how people break those rules or mix them so often you know, much like an 18xx, I can, you know, describe an 18xx to somebody who knows the genre really well in a couple of words, you know, um, you can sort of do the same thing in trick take. You can say, it's a must follow with bidding. It's a must not follow you. It's a must trump. There are certain things you can throw out that give people the basics of sort of how it right. breaks the rules and differentiates them. But for the most part, that's sort of the broad definition of a trick taker. A lot of other games that get lumped into trick taking are what's called clutter, hard to say, climbers and shedders. So what does that mean? A shedder is just means get rid of the cards in your hand. Teach you is an example of that. A race of that, of that yeah. Yeah, a scout is an example of that, a popular example of that. These You have a hand of cards and your goal is to get rid of those cards. Um, and there could be a million ways to do that. Climbers often go with that in that you must beat whatever was played prior to you. So if somebody plays a pair of threes, 
If you want to play and get rid of cards in your hand, you have to pay something higher than a pair of twos. There are a pair of threes. You have to pay, you know, sometimes you can make it a five card straight. Sometimes a flush will beat it. Sometimes you have to stick to exactly what was played. So if there's a single, you must play a single, things like that. So those are, most of these games can be considered either trick takers or climbers and shedders. There's very few examples of games that are just climbers or just shedders, but they do exist. Uh, most Jordan, climbers, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you most disagree. Climbers, yeah, yeah. You think those are two completely different genres? Well, I think Matt put them all in the category of trick taking and then narrowed it down to trick taking and climbers and shedders. And I just think that distinction exists between trick takers. Yeah, and I think in general we can all consider these trick takers. But if you're somebody who is really into this hobby, which I was not until recently, but now I am, I, I clearly can sort of see a delineation between what is it like scout is not a trick taker, but often people say, are you into trick takers? Yeah. What do you like? Oh, I love scout. Yeah. But that, I wouldn't, I'm not going to argue like, yes, of sure, course that's great. Sure. It falls under the banner of the, I, I would just say also, you know, Japanese market card games mm -hmm. or, you know, small box filler card games. There's a lot of ways to sort of define these. I, I totally lumped them together. Yeah, uh, But basically because I don't so much care about the mechanisms as I care about the feels uh, of, sure. of the game. For me, trick takers and climbers and shutters, same thing for me, uh, most closely approximate table games at casinos. Hmm, okay. They feel like gambling. They are micro turns. And the pacing has a certain flow. David, you mentioned flow yeah. um, and, and the way the game proceeds but also we talked about flow on this podcast in terms of a state of mind that you enter yeah, or you sort of get lost within the game and, and and for me it's so easy to do that with a trick taker because you're receiving information about the cards from the cards in your hand and also from the cards that people are playing mm -hmm. and you're also receiving information about their mental state like, are they thinking? Uh, are they not thinking? Are, are they acting automatically? Do they seem happy? Are they trying to hide something? Right. Uh, and when you reach a certain state, like you do in poker, which I believe is also a trick-taking game. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I might not uh, go that far. <laughs> sure. Uh, but but you, you, you get a flow of information from all sources that kind of unites and merges into intuition. Well, that reminds me a lot of my favorite trick-taking game, Magic the Gathering. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, so that, that, that's a great transition for us, actually, Dimitri. So to you, it evokes the feeling of a casino, of gambling. It gives you that sort of feeling. I'm going to talk about why I think I've sort of um, been attracted to this genre and what it does to me and what it reminds me of. So my, when I was actually thinking back on what my very first super positive experiences were with any types of games. And I, I remembered being maybe eight, nine, 10 years old and being taught hearts with my dad. So my dad lived out of the country and I would go visit him often. And, um, you know, when you live overseas and you move a lot, like my dad did, you, you don't carry a lot of things with you, but he always had cards, you know, whenever he went, and that was sort of the game. And so he would often live in areas with people who didn't speak his language and cards is a great way of socializing with people who don't speak the language. And so I remember he taught me cards, uh, and, and specifically hearts. And I was obsessed with that. I remember one summer, I just never wanted to stop playing hearts with him and his friends. And I just loved it. And I loved shooting the moon and all these different things that blew my mind. And I just remembered this feeling of it, 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 it brought me this place where we're sitting outside at a table outside. Everybody's got like a lemonade or an iced tea or something. And we're throwing cards down and we're laughing. And when a card is played, everybody laughs because, oh, you had it. Oh my God. Oh, he's shooting the moon. Are we going to stop him? And I just remember it being such a social calm but fully engaged mentally state that was flow a, yeah exactly yeah. a lovely a lovely mix of relaxation and full engagement um and i i that's how i started feeling with these and they be and i really started enjoying that experience at our game nights as well because i'm so used to these heavy board games that we've been playing that i obviously love and adore i have a whole podcast about them but that for the last 13 years are really so engaging that the social aspect of the night disappears. And I did find that while we've been playing these trick-taking games, I've really enjoyed the socialness of it, the way we talk, the way the game lasts 30 minutes, and then what game are we going to play next, and the little conversations that come there, and the meta game in between games, and how it just sort of builds a different feel of the night that I was, I guess, I didn't even realize I was missing from, you know, a four-hour heavy Euro that by the end of it, you know, 
we nobody's talked, but we've played a very intense game and we had our own fun in that way. But uh, or you can extend that heavy euro, the four hour heavy euro, to fifteen hours, <laughs> so you can have the social exactly, interaction. Right. Right, which, yes, which, trust me, I wish I had the time for. Um, but yeah, that's sort of my feel with them. And I think why I really connected with them. And it's just, it's, it's opened up a whole new avenue for me in our game night and in our group that I've been found, I found really enjoyable. And I'm sure I will, you know, tire of a little bit and want to go back and forth. But I love that I have this new avenue for gaming that I didn't have before. Um, Jordan, what is your experience with Trick Diggers and why do you think you're drawn to them? Yeah, I would say that my earliest gaming experience is also were card games. I think Bullshit was one we played a lot. Sure. Um, Egyptian War, Egyptian Yeah, Rascrit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Gumpsh, which is a t- another team-based sort of card game. And so, yeah, it's, it's a nice social way to interact with people, and they're very positive early gaming experiences. So, yeah. similar to you. But I think, I think to emphasize what you just said, I've been moving away from some of these heavier euros that take two hours and aren't very social. Mm -hmm. And one avenue to do that is with trick taking games. And there are longer games like negotiation games, team based games like war of the ring that we just talked Mm -hmm. about during the card game that allow you to bring a more social element into your game night. Uh, and I think trick takers are a great way to do that. Yeah, it's funny. War of the Ring almost felt like an avenue to this for me. Like it, it happened. I was learning that game at the same time that you had, you and David had introduced me to shamans and other trick takers. And it almost felt like it was all the games I wanted to play had that feel of right. like, pull out a deck of cards, let's go. Right, a deck of cards. And a lot of these games are team based. That's a team based yeah. game. And you're really focused on what other people are playing. But you know, it's light enough that you can still socialize and, and yeah. you know, really be part of the experience. David, as a person with a bag full of small games for a long time, why did you bring them? Why were you excited about them? Why did you want to share them? Why do you, why do you react so positively to them? Well, I think as you guys like joke about as being a friend of the podcast, um, I consider like the group, my, one of my core friend groups. And as such, I find the social aspect of what we are doing to be the, the most important uh, part right. of it and catching up and talking. Card games in, inherently have your head up. Uh, you know, we talked about, you guys talk about having head down games. This is automatically a head up. Your hand's here, you're looking, you're talking. As my grandmother would say, I like the kibitz, you know, it's yep. like that kind of thing. I, I grew up playing card games. I mean, right. my mother is a incredibly talented bridge player. And like, and I grew up in that kind of world in which card games and the talk around card games and the, and the idea of the... I think as Dimitri talked about it, there's something you're learning about people as they're playing cards. You can see people who have hesitancy. You can see people, who, you know, the flow of it. You can see people in the the tempo of it, like people who, you know, are, are holding something in a way that feels like there's tension in there. And there's something really wonderful about that. And it, it leads also to like why I like Avalon, even though some people don't, but it is in that kind of um, alchemy of us as, as, as friends and just hanging out together that I love. Uh, and so I also felt like this was a style of game that was growing and was muting, m- mutating from a kind of older game like Hearts and Spades and, these, and, and, and Euchre and into games that are, I don't think that those people could even imagine that there are games that'd be like Teach You or for that matter, like uh, Nine Lives or all these other games. We have a b- bunch of games on our table here. So, yeah. Uh, and it's been commercialized because of the trick takers, climbers, sh- shredders that we're used to uh, are ones that are played with a regular card deck or right. a variation yeah. on it. Uh, how do you make money off of it? Uh, that creatively. <laughs> Right. Uh, by by tweaking parts of it sure. and, and actually making components that are necessary sure. uh, to, to to the experience. That's the, where the talent comes in, that you don't feel like you're buying a, a deck and, and just a couple of plastic pieces that right. you can throw away. Well, and, and, and it's no it's no coincidence that I've become very into this right now because we are, they are going through what's sort of considered a, a trick taking renaissance right now. It is For sure. it is becoming a huge thing, and a part of it is that it has appealed to the collector and purchaser in in our community, of which board gamers are uh, rife with addiction and capitalistic <laughs> instincts yes. to buy and collect these beautiful physical objects. And the minute that you discover this world, you realize that like they all come from Japan. And they're all gorgeous, and the uh, the the, the production. That's not every, every, everything made in Japan. I mean, gorgeous. like the the, every, the I mean the 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 detail, the attention to detail, the design, the the card quality, the boxes. It is it is so hard to not 
get FOMO and buy. And then you add on top of that, that they have these tiny print runs that sell out immediately. And it just becomes a horribly addictive place for me where <laughs> there's the FOMO is ramp. Like forget Kickstarter. Like, do you want this nine ninety nine game? That's like very cheap, but they're going to make a thousand of them. Good luck. Get it. Like they are <laughs> not that expensive too. No. That's Compared- also a big part of it. Right. Yeah. Is that, there's there, they are like for, a great deal. You have a lot of game. I was also looking for a little bit of a of a niche um, outside of what you guys collect. Yeah. Because I'm in an incredibly lucky position. I don't have to spend the seventy dollars on to let them or whatever that would be because there's already three copies of it. Yep. But I was looking to see like, well, if I was going to have a small collection of games that might be par- outside of what you guys are collecting, this would be a, a place for me to think about. And, and uh, that's what I started doing. And it would be a very affordable hobby if you lived in Japan. Um, <laughs> but the or fact, weren't you? <laughs> if you don't live in Japan, uh, these games cost $10 and 30 to ship from Japan. Uh, so the, the price gets a little inflated there. Yeah. But uh, And I'll talk about that whole process. I'll talk about how I've, how I've gotten into the importing scene and how, how you know how that works if you want to dip your toes into it and stuff because it's impossible to ignore the physical aspect of our hobby no matter what it is and we're always going to talk about the, it is a physical object that you want to own and and I'm not going to pretend I don't appreciate that and uh, I'm, I'm willing to often uh, do what I can to collect these um, and that is a large part of this hobby as well um, outside of the enjoyment of it so that's our experience with all of these trick takers let's go into a little bit of what these trick takers can do and sort of the experience of playing them and why they're so exciting. So we've broken down the basic definition of a trick taker. And if they all did the same thing, we'd all own one and that'd be the only one we play. But what's enjoyable about them is the way they mix and match and do some really interesting, weird things. So I, I, I just want to make this a free flow conversation where we bring up games that have really sparked joy for us um, and talk about why. And I'm going to start the ball off with one of the first ones that blew my mind, which is a game called Nocus Dice. Um, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. I believe that you do not say the U, but it is it is uh, spelled Nokusu, if you were to spell it N-O-K-U-S-U, I believe. Um, and it means leftover die in Japanese. And what that should tell you is that this game doesn't just use cards. It uses dice. And you are playing a sort of classic must-follow trick taker, but you have a hand of cards and you have a hand of dice. So you have multiple suits and then you have those matching suit colors in dice. And at the beginning of the game, you get two random dice rolled in front of you. So let's say you get a yellow two and a yellow six. That's the same as if you had a yellow suited two card and a yellow suited six card or whatever else I just said. Um, You can play those at will, but of course dice are visible to everybody. So you have a bunch of hidden cards in your hand and then the dice in front of you, which work exactly the same as cards, are information everybody knows. And since you must follow, By playing a suit or playing a die in front of me, I know David has to. He cannot play a trump or he cannot win this hand because he has to at least play the die in front of him, which gives me a huge amount of information and opens up this wild tactical world. Add on top of that the bidding aspect. So a lot, let's talk about bidding really quick. So a lot of trick-taking games have a bidding mechanism. What does that mean? It means you are typically betting how many hands you'll win. So let's say I look at my hand of cards at the beginning and I say, I think I can win three. A lot of these games force you to make a bid like that. Um, And then at the end of the round, if you've made your bid, you will score a certain amount of points or certain things happen or you just win or whatever it is. In Nocus Dice, you have a bunch of options for your bid. And in fact, you don't know your bid until the end of the round because, hence the title, Whatever the leftover die is sitting in front of you is your bid. That's it's right. kind of a negative space of bidding. That's right. Because you don't have total control right. over what die you'll have in front of you. You have to follow a color. And if you don't have it in your hand, you have to play it from the dice. That's right. And, 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 and a key mechanism here, to me, the thing that makes it sing is that somebody thought, how do I have drafting in a, in a, in a trick taker, let's right. call it, or, you know, if we, and, and that to me is the most brilliant part of the game. We'll talk about the drafting in this because yeah, I didn't mention yeah. it. Yeah, because that also then allows you to give yourself a, a wide range of options, yeah. but also it's just so interesting in that idea. And the only way to kind of do it was with dice. Probably. How, how does the drafting work? I didn't so, explain it. So, yes, yeah, so you're going to get two die and then you're going to, uh, th- and then the rest of the die, and there's a five colors um, and five dice uh, of, uh, of each color. And they are, uh, out of them, 13 
are going to be put into a it's pile. It changes on the number of players, yeah. but yeah, a bunch and of dice are Yeah, rolled. if there's four people, and you're going to basically, one at a time, each of you are going to take a die and put it in front of you until everyone has five die mm -hmm. in front of them, leaving one die <laughs> in, in the middle. Right. And that die... Again, the leftover die. Leftover die is what determines Trump and the number of Trump. Right. So the number of Trump is going to be from one to six, and then there'll be a color. And that's fascinating, too, because now all of that color is... Our Trump and all of that number, regardless of uh, right. you know, you know so our, our Trump. If that leftover die in the middle that nobody picked during the draft is a purple three, there are no purples in the game anymore. Purples are now Trump, which beats anything else. And there are no threes in the game anymore. All threes are now Trump, which means you cannot play that green three when somebody plays green. Because it is no longer a green three, and you, if, you're fo if you must follow and play a green, that three is no longer a green. It is a trump, and you can't play it if you have other greens in your hand until you're out of greens, and then you can play whatever you want, including that trump. Right, and then the order of trump is the number above the color. So uh, we're playing with uh, cards that are zero through seven uh, right. on these, uh, and so... In, you would think, well, the card, the seven of the Trump is going to be the best card there is. No, that's not true. Actually, any of the other numbers, uh, the number, let's say the number is three again, like three blue is going to be that seven purple. Right. Uh, and also, there's the possibility of having super Trump, which would be you have the number and the color. That, that card can't be beat, except for the fact that, again, like a lot of these games, if you have the highest card and you are the last one into that hand, you win the trick. So I throw, I put a, a, a three down, Matt puts a three down after me, and no one else has a three, Matt wins the trick. The, uh, this game terrifies me in two ways. <laughs> one, <laughs> in that you constantly have to make adjustments. Oh, you, yeah. you can't just read your hand. You can't just read the board. You, you, you have to think. And the other thing is that not after you've made the adjustments, you have to make predictions. I really have to force myself to play more of these predicting games. I have a mental block against predictions. I, I, I have a superstition. I, 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 I love making plans. Every plan is a prediction. But I hate committing myself before I know exactly what's going to happen. And in a trick uh, taker, your predictions have to do as much with your opponent's hands right. or what yeah. you think your opponent's hands are. Yeah. Uh, and, and that sends me into a, a, a dizzy. Uh, uh, Jordan uh, and David, you are scary good at this game. I, I think because you both make excellent predictions. David, you make predictions for a living. That is true. You're a forecaster, so that doesn't <laughs> surprise me. I have... No clue where you get that gift, Jordan. No, I'm not good at this game. I only played this game once and I got trounced. This is the hardest trick-taking game for me to wrap my head around for Ooh. whatever reason. But I want to be good at it. It yeah. just is going to take a lot more plays. It's a it it so to me when I first played this, it was the I was like, trick takers are cool, trick takers are cool. When I played Nogus Dice, I was like, oh, I'm in. I, I have to try all of these. And it was the one that lit my brain on fire that was just like, and it is, it's it it hurt the first time I played it. It was just like almost too much to take in but i but as anybody who knows the games i love would know i like being overwhelmed by options and strategy and, and how rules. interesting one to seven five colors and dice and like zero, things zero you've seven. seen all your life <laughs> yeah. and suddenly you're like lost well and what's yeah. interesting also is i made this game uh it is impossible to get completely right. sold out and it, good luck finding one for under a hundred dollars i'm in i just i can't do that I mean, I don't want to do that because you can just make it out of other things. And Cheaply. I have, yeah. I, yeah. And so, I mean, I took another deck of cards I had and some dice I had sitting around and I, there I had the game. And I think that speaks to how incredible the game is, which I wish I owned because the art is gorgeous in the actual version. Um, and if I could buy it, I would. So it's, I'm not, I wouldn't, I, I, I personally would never print and play a game that I can easily purchase, but I have no problem making one that I have no option of buying. Um, but, you know, the fact that this was just, scrabbled together with a bunch of other games and brought that experience to life to me was really revelatory as somebody who collects board games and cares a lot about it. I was like, the gameplay is so strong here that 
that I, I don't even, I'm not even thinking about the fact that this is like cards from one deck, cards from another, or a bunch of dice I scrabbled together. Um, uh, Jordan and I will do a Patreon only subscriber episode <laughs> about how this is not a violation of copyright. Thank you very much. We do not have a Patreon, nor is this a violation of copyright. <laughs> That's right. No, yeah. I mean, I, I immediately went out and, and made one for myself the day after I played it with you guys. Uh, Everybody so. in our group did it. Tom made one. I think Trey made one. <laughs> Um, I'm going to yeah. have to make one, too, uh, <laughs> just to have it. Yeah. yeah. No, they're lovely. Um, let's just go around the horn here. Jordan, why don't you talk about a game that lit your fuse? Yeah. I think when I first started getting into Trick Takers in this you know, most modern iteration, I played Schadenfreude Ooh. with Candice, and that game is wild. The way, the way it works is when you win a trick, you take the card that you won the trick with and any offsuit cards played into the trick and put them in front of you. And if you ever acquire another card of a value that you already have, that card is lost. Both of the cards are lost, right? So if you ever get a pair, you lose both. And at the end of a hand, you score whatever cards are left in front of you. And the goal is to uh, essentially to come in second. So you play to 40. If ever someone crosses 40, the game is over and the highest player score under 40 wins the game. Right. So you're you're always trying to you know stay in second essentially as much as you possibly can, but what's really interesting is you can see the cards that everyone's collected in front of them. You have to keep them in a row in front of you. And so if someone has a 9 or an 8 or you know a high value card and they're way behind, you can throw them another 9 to cancel it. Or if they're nearing the total, you can probably fairly easily throw them a 9 to put them over the total. Right. And what happens if they tie? What happens if they tie? Yeah. Well, what happens if, if you tie on your score? Then they Honestly, both lose. I have, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Which is hence the Schadenfreude. So oh, okay. That's interesting. You, I forgot that. Yeah. That didn't come up in our play. Uh, I played this game for the first time last week with the Trick Talkers uh, podcasters, which I'll be talking about later. And I loved it. Uh, it also went high to my list of things to try to find copies of. Not easy. Um, I also, I, I, I'm going to try to mention designers when I can, cause I didn't, but no, cause dice is from, uh, Yusuke Matsumoto and, um, uh, Schadenfreude is from a designer who goes by the name CTR, also a Japanese game designer. I'd say 99.9% .9 of these are Japanese game designers and I will, uh, say their names as often as I can. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Schadenfreude was incredible. Um, really interesting experience. I love, like, that's just a, a simple twist is like, don't win, don't lose, come in second. Right. And it creates this great vibe around the table where everyone's looking at everyone's score pile. They're trying to cancel it. You get those, you know, really high moments of canceling someone's great score card, yeah. pushing someone over the edge and the entire table goes, oh, this amazing thing just yeah. happened. Yeah. There's that's something, fun. there's something essentially social about that game. Yeah. And because you have the information in front of you, right, you have this, you're, it's, and that's, and it's evolving over the game. It's it's a lovely mechanism because it's not again sometimes with cards games the the older card games it's all closed information and one of the things I think that has happened in the last fifteen twenty years is this idea of opening information to people through various mechanisms uh, and I think that really makes something interesting and sparky and fun yeah and both of these games we've mentioned so far are recent games Shot and Friday came out in twenty twenty and uh, Nokusu is two thousand sixteen so again you know. Trick-taking renaissance. Yeah. Just one more aspect of Schadenfreude that I think is interesting. There are two skills that I think about developing as we play this game. One of them is prediction and one of them is card counting. Mm -hmm. And Schadenfreude really helps you with card counting because you're really paying attention. Oh, yep. two 11s just left the game. Uh, let me internalize that. You know, there's five 11s or something yeah. like that. And by emphasizing those moments, it makes it easier to sort of develop that card counting skill. I'm an excellent card counter. I was thrown out of a Vegas <laughs> casino with my wife, Moira, once when we were counting cards in 21. That was Dimitri doing Tom doing Dimitri. Very interesting. <laughs> no, no, because he didn't go high enough. <laughs> um, I was <laughs> once thrown out. Oh, my God. Is that the first time we've had Dimitri doing an impression of us doing Dimitri? <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, Dimitri, tell me about a game that has uh, sparked something for you that, that does not teach you. Uh, well, we talk about pain. Uh, and, and and the most pain I've ever uh, been given by a trick taker was, again, a Candace Todd game. And it's a game that we've all played, Cat in the Box. Mm. Uh, because it takes what could have been a nice trick-taking game and adds area control <laughs> yeah. so to it. And then it goes, there are no suits. You tell me what the suit is. 
Uh, yeah, it, tell it, tell us a little it, bit about how the game works for people who uh, don't know. I wish I could. You, you know, basically, you, you, you have a hand of cards from one to something. I, I forget. Um, and when you pl- only when you play them do you declare the suit. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're they're all... You, Basically black or white. There's, there's sort of they're gray suitless, cards yeah. with numbers on them. Yes, right. and, and there, there's a Trump suit. Right. Uh, and uh, when you declare the suit and you win the trick, you get to place uh, a little uh, spicule. What, what do you call those things? A little checker. Cube. checker a, little cube. Yeah. a little checker on a board. Um, and you want to um, group those checkers together because when you make the longest road – a la Terra Mystica, another game I loathe, uh, you get to score it, but only if you win the tricks you that you bid. predicted right. at the beginning. Right. This is a nightmare game for me. This is like has all the mechanisms that are like, like, like stabbing me right. <laughs> deep into my heart. Uh, and by the way, uh, the reason it's called Cat in the Box, there's no cat uh, anywhere. There's no cat in the box. The philosophical gamer is the one who will tell us about this. Yes. Uh, w- what happens in the game is, is that, remember, uh, there are enough cards of each to to play each suit right. once. But if somebody decides to win a trick because they have to, mm-hmm. there could be cards that are not out on the board there could be colors that cannot be played anymore. And, and when that happens, you have a paradox, mm-hmm. uh, and the universe gets sucked into a black hole. Right, and the the, you, you know, the hand ends, and, and, and horrible things happen, and only certain people can score. Right. And there are negative points. And so the, Am the, I doing this? I think there's no, actually the, one additional card. So for every rank, there's, yeah. there's, oh, there's five. Oh, so we're actually but forcing five of you into that yes, situation. Yes, most they of the time. Are. Ah, that explains a they lot. Yeah. Um, I wish I knew that. Jordan. So the, I think the, that's right. Yeah. The game obviously comes from uh, the philosophical term Schrodinger's cat, which is that something doesn't exist until it uh, is... Uh, uh, not philosophical. It's actually a physical... Right, okay, it's sure. A phys- it's right. a quantum mechanics right. concept. So something doesn't exist until it is seen, until it, until it is brought into existence. Or, or it can a cat be anything. is either dead or alive, right. depending on a quantum event that right. you cannot perceive. Exactly. You can only measure it. And- so that is what... So uh, Cat in the Box uh, from uh, Monoyuki Yokoichi is one of the few games that has sort of crossed over and a lot of people who may not be into trick-taking games uh, prior have heard of this game or played it. That and Scout are sort of the two games of our genre of this genre that have kind of had a little bit of a crossover success. I would say the crew is yes, of course. Well, that's a massive hit. Yes, but I just mean like in terms of the that I, I guess I consider the crew a giant game. But yes, um, the crew, Cat in the Box, and uh, uh, what was the other one I just said? Why is my brain? Not? Oh, Scout. Uh, those are ones that I mean, Shut Up and Sit Down has covered them. They've gotten you know they're they're often hard to get because they're popular and they have small print runs. They're sold out. Um, but yeah, Cat in the Box is one of those games that. So you, you, you explain somebody trick taking. It's a little tough that they don't know trick taking because it's so crazy on top of trick taking, but it's something that you teach them and you just see their mind go like, oh, it's crazy what people have been able to do with this genre, like where there are no suits and you, you can just lie and say, um, I don't have that color so that I can now play this. And then you have to take a little marker off so you can never play that color again. And your, your hand starts winnowing, not physically, but uh, potentially in terms of what you're able to play. And you have all these cards that now you're realizing you can never play and a paradox is looming and you're going to lose a lot of points. I just noticed that Cat in the Box has the Heisenberg uncertainty principle equation <laughs> <laughs> written on it. There you go. It's hysterical. Um, yeah, that is one that has an American release. And I, actually, I bought that one on Amazon. It's quite easy to come by. Yeah, um, that, that one's actually at Barnes & Noble. Right. Yeah, that has some crossover. Uh, David, what is uh, tell us about Trick Taker that sparked the fuse for you? I mean, obviously, it, it would it would really be on the modern ones. It would be Teach You, but off of Teach You, and I it's and I'm I'm just kicking myself that I haven't brought the game he, uh, to us yet. I was just talking about it earlier. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's Mew or it's an, a U with an yeah, umlau from 2019. <clears throat> it's on BGA though. Actually, that's where actually, you play no, it. Right? I mean, Mew is actually a 1996 game. It's how it's how old it is. Oh uh, wow. Uh, so it, it and is, these are not Japanese designers. This no, looks this is, like uh, Johan Benvenuto and David Peppert. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so the 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 game is another one of these, and it's actually a little bit similar to a game we just played 
and I'm. It's called the game we just. Oh no, never mind. I, 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 I was just reading you the wrong, yeah. the wrong game. That was the wrong game. So uh, Moo came out in 1995. Doris Mathaus and Frank Nestle. Apologies. The right. game we just played this Le Plateau. Yeah. So the game we just played a Le Plateau. Uh, in that there is a kind of bidding mechanism in which uh, one person becomes the chief, uh, and that chief gets to determine what the uh, the lead Trump is going to be. The, the high Trump is going to be. The person who bid in second place becomes the becomes like the vice. Mike Pence. Yes, becomes the vice. L- less powerful, uh, and, uh, but, and, and gets to pick a second Trump, and that Trump could be a number, or eight, both of them could pick a number or a color, a little bit similar like Dokuse, uh, I think I said it right. Nokus. Nokuse, sorry, Nokuse, uh, Dice. That one, um, and then there is basically the, 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 the chief and his partner or her partner um, have to get a certain amount of points, and the other people playing are working against them. Um, and it is a brilliant deep game for something, especially given how um, how old it is. Uh, seeing someone really a long time ago working out a new way of thinking about these kinds of games. Uh, that one definitely. I started playing that on, on my uh, as an app. I, I uh, when they first came first came out mm-hmm. uh, on the app. It's and, on BGA also. Yeah, and it's it's a very good game uh, and one that I think it is. It has some complexity to it, so it's not a beginner game, but it's definitely one that once you get into the hobby, I think you'd find yourself uh, uh, really seeing the depth and uh, and and the difference, uh, uh, the way it's different than other games. Uh, I really enjoy that one. Um, well, we we've, we've sort of given our ones that sparked for us. Shall we jump to the ones that we think are the best? And I think we'll also that will trigger some more conversation about some other cool games. Sure. Um, Dimitri, I'm very curious to hear what your top three are. Should we let's hear your let's go down? So start from three and go to one. What is your third favorite game that can be classified as a trick taker? Well, uh, because we had this discussion with a Jordan's narrow definition uh, yes. of what trick takers are, I decided to be a contrarian and choose my three favorite trick takers that are not don't fit the definition. That's fine. Uh, number three uh, is Skulls and Roses. Okay. It's a trick-taking game. It's a shedding game. It's a game where you don't want to shed. Uh, you you get. I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm trying to see how it's a trick-taking game. We keep going. Uh, you 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 get three coast. You get four coasters. Okay. Uh, yep. Three covered with roses. One with a skull. Yes. Uh, and then you bid on how many coasters you can collect from other people. <laughs> okay. Okay. And pick them up. <laughs> uh, that. Without taking a skull. Okay, sure. Um, and, and, and you do the bidding by actually placing the coasters uh, upside down so people can't see what what uh, you right. laid down. Okay. Uh, and then the highest bid has to collect as many coasters that don't have skulls right. as they can. It's a, a, a classic bluffing game that we love. We've played a billion times. I, I can see how there's some trick-taking aspects in that. It's the first game I played with you. Oh, is that right? At your, at your old house. Oh, you'll never forget that, will you? Yeah, I know. It was terrible. <laughs> um, okay, sure. Skull and Roses. You're broadening the definition of trick taker. Uh, Dimitri's the cat in the box of definitions. <laughs> is it a trick taker? <laughs> there is no, there's he nothing. He doesn't know if it's a trick taker until he says it. Exactly. No, he actually said it does not comply with the right. definition of a trick taker. any right? of the rules. I'm, I have a pretty broad idea. Yeah. I have a pretty broad idea of trick taking. That is not a trick taking. I'm game. not just a Schrodinger's cat. I may not even be Dimitri. That's right. Uh, well, well, we, I only get to hear one more from him because I think I know what his number one is. But David, why don't you hit us with your number three? I thought that for number three, I would bring up what I think is one of the more interesting of the classic o- older games, just because I thought if you were going to look at one, and I think actually Euchre, which is spelled E-U-C-H-R-E, right. is a game that is played at a very high level, uh, has like championships, and and one that uh, is... From is, 1848. Yeah, and it's pretty, it's an old game. Uh, and it is designed a, by Uwe Rosenberg. Actually. Yeah, it's incredible, yeah, isn't it? Really shocking. It, this is pre-farm days. Yeah. Uh, and it is a game that it, it's a relatively simple game, uh, but you're playing with a partner and uh, you're, you know, if you win, if you're winning the, 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 the hand, let's say you, uh, if you, if you just win it, you get a point. If you win it, all the cards of that, of that particular round, you get two points, things like that. It's a really good, simple game. There's a 
million different ways you could play it. Um, and I think it's just an interesting idea of like, oh, how do I look at some of the older games and, and find one that's interesting? Yeah, that's one of the wonderful things about this, uh, this subgenre of our hobby is that like a lot of the greatest games in this genre you already own because you have a deck of cards in your house yeah. somewhere. Everybody has a deck of cards in their house. And you own a lot of these games. Like, and there was a, you could try a lot of different styles of trick takers and games that would fall under this category without having to spend a penny. Right. And, and uh, I think Shut Up and Sit Down did an entire series yeah, of uh, you know, games that you can play with a deck of cards. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I got really into the, the solo game Regicide like a year or two ago. And I remember it was just like, just pull out a deck of cards and start playing this awesome new game somebody came up with. Regicide's great. Yeah, Regicide's really cool. Um, all right, my number three is Scout. Uh, Scout is a climbing shedding game. Scout is, I think, absolutely incredible. Um, it is. It, it does a couple things right off the bat that are really interesting. First of all, your dealt a hand of cards. Uh, this is the uh, designer is Kay Kajino. Um, and there are a couple different versions. There's an Oink Games version, and there's a uh, another version as well that I own. I own both of them. They're both pretty nice. Um, the uh, the coolest thing about this game, the first thing you notice is you're handed a uh, stack of cards. Everybody's dealt cards. When you pick them up, you are told you are not allowed to organize your hand. Often something that happens to, to players, you pick up your hand, you put all your hearts together, you put all your da -da 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 things. In this one, you, get, you don't have to do that. You could save some time. You're not allowed to touch your hand. But in fact, you'll notice that the numbers on the top of the cards are different than the numbers on the bottom. And you are given an option at the beginning of the hand. Do you want to play your hand as it is? Or do you want to flip the whole thing upside down and play the other numbers? And once you've made a choice, you are locked into that for the rest of the game. And then it becomes a fun and semi-typical uh, shedding and climbing game. I can never say it. Shedding and climbing game. You're trying to get... Climbing and shredding. That's right. You're trying to get rid of your cards uh, by playing melds, as they're called. So you can play singles, you can play doubles, you can play straights, you can play... Uh, four of a kind you can do you can play things like that um but you have another fun option is if you can't play anything you can hence the title of the game scout which means you can take a card from the meld in front of you from somebody else's and add it anywhere in your hand thus making new possible melds in your hand that you can play later on when you do that though the person whose meld it is gets a point and if you are able to beat the meld in the middle, you take all their cards. And when you flip them over, the backside of the cards are victory points. So you actually, every card that you beat is a point. And anytime you need to scout a card from somebody, you're giving them a point. Um, and every card you're left with at the end of the hand, when somebody has shed their entire hand, or everybody has to pass in a row because nobody can do anything with it, you lose one point for every card in your hand. So often this is a game that goes into negatives, especially early on. But really gave me the closest I've had to that hearts feeling of everybody around the table, your hand. I, if you know me, you know that I love making lemonade out of lemons. And this is that you get a handful of lemons and how are you going to make this work? And whoever sort of figures it out the fastest is the winner. And I love that aspect, that puzzle aspect of it. There's also a really fun rule where once per round, you can scout and play, meaning I can take a card and immediately beat something with it. That's a really fun thing. That's sort of your bomb. When are you going to use that? That often ends the round, does something really cool, makes it so nobody can uh, follow afterwards. Just I've taught this game to so many people in the past month. I bring it with me everywhere. I've just brought it out to random people who've never played before. Everybody gets it in two minutes and everybody buys a copy right afterwards. Like it's just, it's one of those like, uh, it sells itself and everybody loves it. It's infectious. It just will spread through your group of friends. Uh, Candace taught it to me. Did did Candace teach it to you? No, I I hadn't. I missed the the time when you guys were all playing it with Candace and she had an early copy of it. Yeah. yeah. And Candace yeah, taught it to me too. Tom taught me, but improperly. Um, so, uh, hey, so Tom, so Tom <laughs> hey, taught don't, you. Don't, don't tell <laughs> trash about me. But uh, I think also what you, what one of the things that I think that is coming uh, clear from this is that actually shedding and climbing actually generally have to go together. Yeah. Uh, because of the idea that you then don't know exactly when somebody would be out of out of their out of their hand. Like the idea that, oh, now you put two cards, I can go three cards, and boom, I'm out uh, in a way that acts as, as a sort of accelerant and, and makes it very tense. Right. Uh, Scott has this great competing tension, too, where you can either try and go out quickly or try and make an unbeatable meld. Because if right. you make an unbeatable meld and everyone passes uh, in order, you win that yeah. hand, essentially. And and this is a game that I, I've you know I've heard criticisms that I can't disagree with. You could just get a hand that you're that's almost impossible to do anything with, and you lose 
eight, nine points in a round, and you barely even had it. I mean, this is a game also that sort of at higher player counts uh, plays from two to five. At five, yes, it, you could never have a chance to play, and somebody could, you know, maybe you get to play one thing or scout once and give somebody a point, and then by the time it comes back to you, everybody's gotten out. Three to four players feels really good to me. This actually has a really fun two-player variant that plays a little bit differently that I actually uh, played with my wife a bunch that we've really enjoyed. Um, but yeah, it's not bad at five. It's just, you know, like any card game can get a little chaotic with higher player counts. That's the nature of card games, right? And I think, you, yes. again, that's something you've talked about. Uh, the Part of their, them is that they don't take a long time. But you absolutely, every one of these games, almost, you could have a hand and you're just like, you're out. You look at it, you say, this isn't great. Right. Yeah. Uh, Which but, is why you usually don't just play one hand, right? Right, that's why you keep playing. And that's the, that's what I love, right? You, you get it, you play it, you play it again, and you really find that in over time... You had your good hands and your bad yes, hands. There, there right. is a fair share of luck in almost all of these games. Um, but I do believe that over time, the stronger player will prevail in, in almost all of these for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen David win almost yeah. every game. <laughs> um, what is your number three, Jordan? Yeah. So a quick caveat. There's, I'm only choosing games that I've played at least 10 hands of or more. Sure. So a lot of games I've only played once, like Bug Council of Backyardia, Trick Takers, Nikosu Dice... Uh, Le Plateau, and I think those actually might be some of the best, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, but my number three is going to be Nine Lives mm-hmm. by Taiki Shinzawa. I just bought this. A Japanese designer. It's great. It's so cute. It's, I mean, the cats are just adorable. It's got very cute cats, and so this is a trick-taking game that is non-standard in two ways. One is there's a bid at the front of the game wherein there's two columns of the numbers one through four, and you have to bid in one column, but you can either bid for one of those numbers or you can bid across two adjacent numbers. So you could, for instance, bid two or three. And when you bid, you are you place a physical token down and no one else can bid on those numbers. So there's almost like a little area control aspect of the bidding. And if you're fourth to bid, you might be forced to bid one number exclusively, like only one or only four. And... This is an excellent my first bidding game. It's a great my first bidding game. It's also a great my first trick taking game because the other aspect of the game that's interesting is that all the cards have their suits on the back. So when you're dealt a hand, everyone can see exactly how many cards you have, exactly how many Trump you have. Trump in this game, I think, is purple. And so it allows you to learn deduction a little bit better. You know exactly you know, okay, David has three yellows and one Trump. How am I going to counteract that? And it also allows you to sort of plan your hand a little bit more easily and get that skill going as well. So because it gives you more information, you can achieve, you know, certain moves that would be difficult to achieve or would require prediction or other sorts of knowledge in another trick-taking game. And that feeling sort of expedi- you know, it, it pushes you forward into the higher level plays of trick taking gives you that feeling without requiring you to develop all those skills up front. Right. And while at the same time being extremely enjoyable, I, I would imagine for not that I am one, somebody who has a lot of experience with trick takers, it's still interesting and different and, and super fun. Yeah, I think so. Because inherently whenever you're predicting someone's hand or you're trying to draw inferences from certain card plays, you don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. But in this game, you do know, you know that David has no Trump so that you can, yeah. you know, run the table. And the scoring is simple and interesting that, it, you know, if, if you, if you, if you pick one number to hit your bid, you get two points per trick. Right. And if you pick, if you go, no, sorry, it, it's, it's a standard, either four points if you hit it exactly. And two points if you don't, which, which, which is nice because games like ghost of Christmas and things have been criticized for having very swingy, weird, um, hard to catch up, uh, scoring systems where, you know, they incentivize you bidding high or else how are you ever going to catch up again? This game, it doesn't matter how high you bid. You're going to get, the, if you're going to get a certain amount of points, if you hit exactly your bid and a certain amount, if you, if you give yourself some wiggle room, but you have two numbers too, right? Because right. the numbers are one through four and they're also five through eight. Right. It and so around. it goes, yeah. yeah, loose around. So when you go from four, you go back to one, if you win another trick, which also gives you a little, Throw someone a trick they don't want moment, right, right. which is a really fun. You also fun can bid in such a way that forcing someone eventually to bid um, a single number instead of a range of numbers because of the way the little tiles are on the board, which is also kind of a, a bit of a gamer idea. Yeah. And the, the designer of this game, uh, Taiki Shinzawa, is is sort of the I, I won't say the Uwe Rosenberg or whatever, but very prolific designer in in the trick taking space has done Mask Man, Ghost of Christmas, Nine Lives, American Bookshop, Luz. Ambient to Bizzle, a segment tricks, a lot of just very beloved games, and is clearly a real genius in the trick taking design world. Yeah, and as and for a Japanese designer, his games are generally available. Right. 
Yes, a lot of these are, are, are possible to get. Um, yeah, boardgametables.com did print runs of Nine Lives and Ghosts of Christmas. Yeah, and they've done a, they did a Kickstarter, their next four recently. Um, Dimitri, uh, do you want to tell us about um, some sort of dexterity game now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. no, no, my second favorite game is, is the Pool. bowling. It's a game uh, Dimitri's <laughs> grandmother taught him. I, I'm sorry. My grandmother taught me, um, and, and that uh, my family and I played uh, when we were emigrating, when we were Ooh. stuck in Rome. So sad for two months. Uh, uh, well, waiting to be processed by the American embassy. Uh, it's called Durak, uh, and it's the the fool or the idiot uh, in Russian. Uh, and it's a game played with a regular deck uh, where you call cards uh, values two through five. Deal out uh, a hand of six cards to two to four players. Uh, lay down a card that will announce the Trump suit uh, and a draw deck on top of it. And basically, one player starts attacking the player to their left, um, and they can lead with any card. Uh, the other player can beat that card with a higher value or a Trump of any value. Now, when there are two cards on the table... Uh, the trick can be over and you shed it, or uh, the person, any of the people at the table can now attack with a card that matches the value of any of the cards played. So for example, if I lead with a six uh, and Matt uh, beats it with a nine, I can now play a six or a nine uh, for Matt to beat, uh, or any other player at the table can play a six or a nine, and so on. Until of co- two, one of two things happens. Either Matt beats six cards with his hand of six, in, in which case he has shed all his cards uh, and will now draw from the deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, or he can't beat or chooses not to beat because the cards on the table are so valuable. They're, they're juicy. He can take them into his hand. Right. And now he's playing with a hand that has a lot of cool cards. Some of them we remember because we just saw them. Uh, and then everybody draws up to six. Uh, and uh, ultimately the trump will be picked up. And when everybody has shed and there are no more cards to draw and only one person is left holding cards, that person is the idiot, the fool, the dummy. <laughs> you, you know, it's a family game. It's a family game. And if one person's always the fool. <laughs> you know what this feels like a bit? It feels like war combined with trick-taking. Yeah, and it, 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 to me, it's the perfect climber shredder. Uh, really easy to learn, but it probably is the one that teaches you to use your memory mm-hmm. yeah the you most, have to remember what others because talk, yeah. as the game proceeds you've seen over well you've seen all of the deck you 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 can remember the the hands that were shredded you you remember the cards that you had you remember the cards that were played if you can't tell with absolute certainty what everybody's holding by the end you just shouldn't be playing. You just should be left behind in, in Russia and, and not come to America and, and not go to college. And this like, is how your family decided Maybe not even be come. fed or something. But. Yeah. <laughs> Have you said what Dirac means? Idiot. Yeah, okay. Just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but uh, it, 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 it's, I haven't played the game in a very long time because it, it, is, it, it does require practice. Right. Uh, but it, it holds a special place in my heart for me. Uh, I think it's a game, because it can be played with a regular deck, can be enjoyed on the road when you're mm-hmm. fleeing from Cossacks. And, well, and, and my uh, favorite part of the game was coming up with puns on the word Darak. So we kept saying, can you smell what Darak is cooking? Or Darak is in the building uh, every time we played a card. <laughs> and that was my favorite part of the game. Yes. Oh, by, by the way, I, as Tom Donnelly playing Dimitri Porter. I should say, welcome to Jew Brain. Yes, we are. These are all four Jews talking about card games. We're just Jews talking, just Jews playing cards. And not talking about can- Canasta. Right. Or, or Kaluki. Um, or Kibitzing. Or ki- right. Kibitzing while playing bridge. What, uh, what is your number two, David? Um, I'll, I'll go with uh, Bug Council of Backyardia. Uh, I, partly also because I just want to talk about how um, 
in the in recent years now you have a bunch of games that are uh, using cards to then manipulate a board also uh, so they're adding another layer to the uh, to the to, to this idea of, of of a card game and in this one um, in a simple the simple way to put it would be that there's a, a Moncala device uh, of colors that you, where you have cubes and you're moving them around and onto the different colors. And based on how many cubes are of, are on that color, that determines whether the, the rank of Trump. Right. So the most everything cubes... Everything is Trump. Everything is Trump in essence. And so everything... It is, again, it's a must-follow, but it has... But within that context, when you put down uh, an offsuit uh, and it's a green, if that one has five cubes and uh, and Jordan puts down a yellow that ha- you know that has it's a higher number, but it only has two cubes on that one, it doesn't matter. Mine, my, my higher Trump is going to beat that one. And then it has this mechanism by which the person who played who followed suit but is the lowest card who followed suit, they get to control that Mancala uh, um, manipulation. And at the end of the game, uh, you're going to have your tricks that you took uh, for points, and basically, uh, and then you'll have a bonus based on the last card in your hand, how many cubes are on that color. So you're also looking to manipulate at the end of the game and holding a card that you hope is going to get you bonus. Um, there's also a way of, of not taking any tricks in another part of the game, but basically that's it. And I think that as an example of a game that does that really well, I think Bug Council is, 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 is fun. And also you get to say the word Bug, bug council of backyardia, which I think is you it's know, just enjoyable. Just enjoyable to say that. To say it. Uh, you, so this is from Patrick Engro and Kyle Hanley. Uh, BGG says they are two designers based out of Tokyo, Japan. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's there's Japanese all over. Came from office. 2022. I really enjoy this one. This is also one of those that just when you play and you just go, man, it's so cool. What like people are able to continue to find new things to do with this genre. Like, Jordan, you yeah. hate this game, don't you? No, I like it a lot. There's a great moment in it when you're the one who gets to manipulate the Moncala and you take mm-hmm. five cubes out of yellow and distribute them amongst the other colors. And, you know, yellow went from super Trump, you know, unbeatable to the worst suit in the game. Yeah. That's really fun. And the shoot the moon mechanic is really cool too because you discard a card at the beginning of your of, of the hand so you don't get the bonus, right? Yeah. And you're playing with reduced options, but if you can make it through, you're going to score a ton of points. Yeah, you get 10 points plus whatever's in the central n- n- no-color uh, circle, which, again, is a different part of the mechanism. But, right. but uh, yeah, it's and, and you play a few rounds, and it, it's just, it's great. Uh, and there is some, and I like also there's some continuity between the rounds, right, with, with the way, in the way that the cubes are laid out, and then you're feeding Col- uh, some of the some of the extra cubes into it. You're seeding those colors a- as you go forward. So this ever shifting idea within the game, but connecting it between rounds, is a brilliant idea. Um, and I, it, it deserves more play. Yeah, this is one I want to explore a lot more. My number two. Now I went a little bit different than Jordan here, and so I, I did the opposite. Jordan said he's not going to put things on his list unless he's played them ten times. Knows I sort of put on my list things that. I think will be in my top three after <laughs> a lot more plays. I went, okay. I sort of went with the three things I'm most excited to play. Okay. Okay. And the things that I've, that I really think have huge potential. I'm very excited to play. So, um, scout is something I, I have played at least 20, 30 times now, but, um, but I, I still hunger to play it. These are the sort of, I guess, in essence, the top, I've, I'm too new to this to say these are my the three best in the world, mm-hmm. but these are my the three I'm most excited to play. My number two is a game called Trick Takers. Um, what a generic name for such a interesting and wild game. So Trick Takers, uh, which is spelled um, strangely normal, except Trick Taker is capital and the S is lowercase. Um, and all one word. And all one word. The designer is uh, Hirokin. Um, and this is, I guess people have been describing it as Root the Trick Taker. So this is, but I, I would actually say it reminds me more of the asymmetrical roles from Marco Polo in that um, the, the, they all have what sounds like broken, overpowered abilities. So this is a game where at the beginning of the game, you are drafting a character. And that character will often come with completely different victory conditions, sometimes an entirely new deck of cards to play from, sometimes wildly different powers, different skills, 
an entirely new game to learn. And much like, I guess, Root, uh, in order to play well, you have to know what all of the characters do, not just the one you're playing, but the ones you're playing against. What is interesting, though, is that much like in a trick taker, you're playing multiple hands, you're not going to be that character every hand. Um, you're going to get to pick a different one every hand. So a lot of the fun tactical aspect of this game is, what do I need now to stop X player or to help myself get the victory points needed? The game can end in a handful of ways. It can win just by getting the most tricks two out of three rounds. So if you get the most tricks and you get the most, not tied for the most, you get a gold crown. You play three rounds. If you if you get a gold crown twice, you just instantly win the game. You also can, quote unquote, shoot the moon. If you get no tricks, you get a black crown. If you do that three times, meaning it happens all three rounds, you also instantly win the game. There are, of course, hierarchies of winning if you the gold crowns beat the black crowns. And then if nobody gets either of those victory conditions, it comes down to points. Who gets the most points? And often that's how the game will end. And so points can become very important. But that tension of somebody could win the game before we get to points is what keeps it very engaging and competitive throughout. Uh, Matt, uh, the thing that makes the game really interesting for me uh, is that you get to see the ca the cards that you've been dealt and then pick the role That's that right. you're going to play. And what that means is if you know the roles really well, you can say, oh, for this hand... Mm -hmm. I should really get the gambler. Right. Uh, and, and to me, that's like really cool because it's not a layer on top of it. Uh, it, it it's actually completely involved and right. intricately interconnected. Yeah. This is a game that I've only played twice now, I think, but I... I, I feel like I want to play it a hundred times before I even really know if I like it. <laughs> like, or if, if I know I like it, whether I think it's really works, I guess, yeah. because it's, there's so many different people you can play as so many different characters. They're all so interesting and different. You could almost like quote, you know, to use a video game term main one and just play that for a while and get really good at it. I think to a certain extent, like there's, there's a skill level to all of them and understanding how they work. And then a skill level to understanding how they interact in an ecosystem with the other ones. There's an entire expansion that adds like eight more characters. There's a game called little trick takers. That is an entirely standalone game that uses a lot of the same rules and characters, but plays a little faster. There's a game called trick takers Kings, which is, is also a standalone game i believe so there's there's a whole trick takers world that um is only in japanese and these cards have a ton of text on them and a ton of rules and right now you can only get them japanese so how have i played this well um, there are lovely people in this community who have uh, made uh, translations and paste ups, which are literally just print out the English version and tuck it into a sleeve along with your card. And that's how I've sort of learned uh, a lot of those rules and been able to play with them. Um, but I will tell you later on how uh, this will be coming to America sometime in the next year or two. Not the America. I mean, it'll be coming to the English language and shipped worldwide in the next few years. Another another thing you can do also uh, is use Google Translate uh, the camera the camera and it will actually translate oh, relatively well. So uh, especially if the cards aren't like you know a paragraph of text, if right. they're just some text, it does a very good job of telling you telling you what everything. But this is. will also make up legal citations and cases that don't. It exist. will also iterate eighteen new games. Right. Uh, so. <laughs> One interesting um, aspect of this game that I think is worth highlighting is that every hand is only five cards, yeah. and you don't deal out the entire deck. So some of the deduction elements... In because other games, there's a lot of characters who draw cards from the deck, right? Right, exactly. So some of the deduction elements from other games are a little bit reduced, and it's more about how do I make the most of this hand, which character goes best with this hand. Well, and that, yeah, so you can't use your typical trick-taking skills here because it's you're, 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 very, you're often immediately what we call short-suited, meaning right. like, you know, this is a must-follow game, and often what you're trying to do in a lot of these games is get rid of a suit so you become short suited so that you can play anything and then sort of have a little more control you're already short suited probably in at least one thing off your five cards so it's much more about how do i manipulate the character i'm playing to get points or to get a gold crown or a black crown or whatever i'm, I'm aiming for this round right um which is really fascinating um and yeah so this game is uh the um there is a gaming company in america pgc PGC, which is the uh, Portland Gaming Collective, and they um, have said that they are coming out with a uh, English version of this. Um, I won't say when. I think they've said they'll announce it sometime this year. Um, maybe it'll even go to Kickstarter this year. They made a wonderful game called Five Three Five and Bridge City Poker, which are both incredible, uh, both great climbing shedding games. 
Um, and they're hosting a convention in July, yes. they, which I'll be attending. Yes, um, which is just trick taking games for an entire. I weekend. wish I could go. Yeah, I know. I wish I could too. It, it, you know, and also, by the way, this is a good time to say how Portland has become this sort of center of uh, trick taking, uh, yeah. and uh, I think we all watch uh, Taylor's uh, channel. He's yeah, and at the Portland. end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about all the wonderful resources. That yeah. just, uh, we are amateurs at this. 100%. <laughs> percent are not professional. But that's our, our perspective is we yeah. are, here's, here's what it looks like when you're not new, experts. newer to this world. Speaking of which. I'm not an expert at all. But my number two choice is going to be Inside Job. Yes, designed queen. by Tanner Simmons and put out by Cosmos, which also put out The Crew. And Inside Job is a uh, social deduction trick-taking game wherein you'll be given a role at the beginning of the game. You may be a basic agent. You may be the insider. And their victory conditions are different. There's a deck of missions, and those missions might say something along the lines of the second card played must win the, tr- uh, must win the trick, or the second and fourth cards played must be of the same suit, or whatever the case may be. And if that condition is fulfilled over the course of the trick, that mission is successful. And at X number of missions, depending on the player count, the uh, the agents win. However, the insider only wants to collect intel, which are these little briefcase tokens. Whoever wins the trick, which is decided separately from whether or not the trick is successful, gets a briefcase token. And if they hit their total, they win. So you're trying not to let any one player win too many tricks while also passing these missions if you're an agent. If you're the insider, you're trying to find excuses to pass, uh, to win tricks and fail missions. And the insider has one trick up their sleeve they don't have to follow suit. Everyone else does have to follow suit. They can just lie. They can like just anything lie. they want. Right. And there's this inbuilt as I did. mechanic where, right, as David did. <laughs> and there's this inbuilt mechanic where, depending on the player count, you'll keep one or two cards at the end of the hand that won't be played out into tricks. So if you're, you know, if you still have a yellow card, but you don't want to, you know, but you want to play off suit, you can hide that yellow in those two cards that are never played. So you're never revealing to the table that, oh, I broke the rules. I must be the insider. Additionally, the box has a bunch of other roles in it, much like Blood on the Clock Tower, where there's you know special roles. Or role Avalon. Cards, or Avalon. And those cards really shake things up. There's one in particular that's brought a lot of joy to us called Tim Shady. And Tim, <laughs> Tim, the, re- the real Tim Shady. The real Tim Shady, right. <laughs> Tim Shady wins the game if the player to his right loses. And so there's this whole, this whole mechanic <laughs> where you know, you're looking at these different pairs of players around the table. You're trying to figure out you know, what everyone is. And uh, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, really it's a wonderful Cylon from Battlestar Galactica type role, where it's like, they will decide if they're good or bad. Once they figure out what the person to their right is, right. Exactly. <laughs> and then they are whatever the opposite is of them. Right. And, and most can... likely there makes them bad, but it's a little bit of a, a, a randomized self-balancing uh, element of like, you know, there's, there's Tim Shady's either going to be another bad guy or, another good guy, which will then help you know who the bad guy is to a certain extent. Right. And for me, this game is a lot like Secret Hitler because the random draw of cards or in Secret Hitler policies kind of gives you cover to claim, uh, yeah, I'm course. not a bad guy. No, it's this a trick taker. Yeah. Right. You sometimes have to, you, you must follow. So unless you're the bad guy, in which case. You right. And whoever leads the trick picks the mission and they draw two and pick one. Right. And they can. They are, in fact, not allowed to talk about the one they do not pick. I think this game is incredible. It would have probably been my number four if I could, or it could even be my number one in, in a couple months because I, I am enamored with it. I think it is absolutely incredible, and I'm really glad somebody else put it on their list because I, it, 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 it with Nocus Dice is one of those games where I played it and I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. Like yeah. this is wild. The the only. I would say the only thing that is a limiting factor on it, which I, and I only played it once and really enjoyed it, is that I, it, with a social deduction game, you wish it could go more than five people, right? Because sometimes when you want to play a social deduction game, you have eight people, nine people, which is something like what Avalon can do. And uh, because it's limited at five, I would love to have them maybe find a way to have an expansion that could get it to, yeah, to a higher I, number. I, I, I think there's a standalone expansion. It's get another box of inside job and play two games with four. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, <laughs> oh, you're saying two different games. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think you could play with more than No, that. I don't it'd be I don't know if you'd want to play a trick game with nine people, uh, just because you, you would never I guess yeah, with the way that the rules card. are and how you have to follow this or that, yeah, yeah, exactly. it'd be impossible. But I will say, I think there's an expansion that could come out for this game and should. More, it's roles. Just more roles. Well, yeah, the roles course. are great. They add yeah. so much. I would different. say if you play this game, play the basic game once and then forget about it and just start mixing up the other characters. Because to me, that's where the game is. I think the game really comes in finding, I mean, just like your group 
uh, or our, our group has found, you know, these specific roles and none shall ever be changed or added. Um, I, oh, for Avalon, you're talking yes, about. Yes, yeah. I like that we that we have yet to find the ideal, most fun version of this game, and we get to experiment and try that out. And maybe there isn't. Maybe it's just that. Maybe it's the variety of it that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's inside job. Fantastic choice, Dimitri. Shock us with your number one. What could it possibly? We, we did be? a whole episode about Teach You, uh, my wife and Dimitri. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Tom and I and Moira. I, I, and uh, uh, it, it's a great game. It's a a game I can I I can play again and again. I want to play right now. I, I want to say something philosophical about it. Uh, as, briefly, as is your want. That uh, uh, for me, trick takers work on the combination of compulsion uh, and, and uh, limitations. Uh, you, 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 I, I think as writers, Matt, we love limitations. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, t- tell me to write a five-page essay. Great. Right. Fantastic. Tell me to write whatever I want and, and I'm lost. Right. Teach who has uh, the most interesting limitations because you play poker hands. Uh, Somewhat. And there are very complicated rules about what beats what. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fewest compulsions, uh, other than uh, responding to a call on, on the first hand, you don't have to play. You, you, you don't have to follow. You, you don't have to beat. You can bide your time. So for me, it's the best combo. It, it, it makes it even more strategic. Now, I do have to say that every trick taker tr- that I've played, they're not really one-card hands. You usually have to set up in the, in the earlier hand to give yourself the lead or make sure... You're the last person to play. So there are always combinations of cards. I think, Jordan, you're really good at seeing combinations of cards uh, in in games like uh, uh, the Schrodinger's Cat, where you go, uh, if I can play an eight and I have a seven, I can follow up and I can win two tricks in a row. That was literally David. (laughs) That was me. Oh, that was David. That was me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but, okay. That's but okay. Andrew, there you go. Please continue to compliment. Yeah, yeah. Me. I love it. I like great. that you think I'm Jordan. Though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically, well, it's David next has, to one of us. David yes. is the most strategic here. Uh, but Jordan, when you wore that gray shirt with the purple pocket with the flowers on it that one time, it was, you looked so handsome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Teach you for me has the perfect balance uh, 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 of compulsion uh, and constraint. Yep. Uh, the most constraints, which I love. Uh, the least compulsion. Which it also has this lovely give and take, right? Like you start the game giving away cards and getting cards and you're getting information, I mean, usually from your the, your foes, not much information, but sometimes. But your partner, you're telling them something right away from the beginning of the game about what kind of card you're giving. And that should give some indication of what's going on in the game. And I think that helps a lot. And also it just has, the game has so much depth. I've played it a thousand times, and I and I have not run out of uh, sort of interest in playing it more. It, it actually though does create a little bit of tension with me because I have the expectation that I'm good at it, and therefore I walk into that game yeah. with like with like a certain amount of trepidation that I'm going to fail. No, teach you is a masterpiece, and, and definitely one of the games that I would say every gamer should own and play it on BGA too. Uh, yeah. It's a terrific implementation. It is. Uh, it I, speeds up play. It orders the cards. I find for it's a little you. tough to play a partnership game online. Yeah, I, 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 I agree find, with you. On I that. find it a little difficult to. To I mean, it just feels like there's a little more randomness. And is my does my opponent know what they're doing? Or you know, or yeah. I don't know. There's oh, you, you can at on BGA. I've played with people who had no no clue. Yeah, and I've also played against people who were using multiple accounts. Sure, so every person at the table except me yeah. is basically the same person playing against me. Uh, what uh, to what people will do for Elo. Elo. Which yeah. is odd, given that there's no money involved. Um, so the, but it feels like there is. It this, feels like this so game much is, is from 1991. It's from Urs Hostetler. Um, I will say my only negative with Teach You is that I think it is unenjoyable to play with people who aren't competent at the game. And and is very difficult to make new players because it is extremely complicated to the lay 
person. That is correct. Somebody who is not accustomed to either complicated heavy board games mm -hmm. or complicated trick takers. I find or but if you're a poker player, sure. But even still, I find still though there's these, I, <laughs> the, the amount of the amount of like it. eyes glazing over I've witnessed while trying to teach this game and somebody just going. Yeah, no, I think we're going to not play this. Like halfway through the team. The dragon like, does what? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's too much for most people. Um, and I, but I think there is maybe no more enjoyable card experience, at least team-based, um, than with four people who have played it uh, a million times, which we are lucky enough to have. But I, I've never brought this out to three non-gamers and, and enjoyed it. Ben played it for eight hours uh, with, with uh, three other people. At, uh, were you there? For that or Jordan? No, I wasn't there for that. I wish David was there. David, though. yeah, David, you were there. Right? No, no, no. I, I, <laughs> I was, I was not there. I, I tried not to play any game for eight hours. Uh, yeah, that's Teacher. Great game. I've honestly only played Teach You a handful of times. I really want to play it yeah. a lot more. All right, well. It may be too deep. Yeah, okay, you, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm not yeah. sure you're exactly you right You know, enough. I'm so glad you warned me off. Now I can just skip it. David, what is your number one? Trick taker, climber, shatter. Uh, yeah, it, it it has to be at this point. Uh, it is Nokusu uh, dice. I, I I it blew me away. I I love the various elements of it. Look how it, this has all come full circle, David. Because yes. you you were the one who brought t trick takers who got yeah. me in love with it, and then I learned a new trick taker that is now your favorite trick taker. Yeah, I mean, literally, I built a, a new a, a you know a, a version of it the ne that night. I went home and 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 made that happen. So it's. Uh, again, I think the depth on it is extraordinary, um, and it, and will lead to, I think, lots of interesting. And it has what I one of the things I love, which is it has emergent play. Right, you really have to pay attention to what's happening and how that is shifting um, elements. But you're also establishing your ability to be flexible from the beginning of the game. Um, and there's also a psychology about it. Right, I can look at. At, at Dimitri's hesitancy as he takes that yellow one, I go, hmm, that might say something to me that uh, also is a, it adds richness to it. So it's a heads-up game. It's got... It, it's a brilliant, brilliant game. Wildly and it shocks me yeah. that it's not avail available. Like... Somebody has to bring they're, this game out. They're it's, going to do a, a new printing. Yeah, it is yeah. such a good game. The skill ceiling is so high. Because <laughs> yeah. in our one game, I watched David just trample everyone. Well, getting exactly his bit every time. It's like it's it's interesting to see such a high skill ceiling when there is so much luck with card draw. And yeah, I mean you things. can right. I think the uh, drafting uh, right, really. but because of the ability to to be flexible, uh, it, it it does uh, uh, it does take some of that luck element out of it. Um, and, and by the way, you can shoot the moon in the game too, which I did not attempt in that game we played. Yeah, you can. Uh, say, I never had a hand that made any sense for that. Yeah, you can but, declare that and get a lot of points. And you can get you can just. It's almost the game is basically over at that point if you shoot the moon and everyone else and everyone else is, <laughs> yeah. is out. You you're just like points. okay. Uh, you, you for are. noobs like Dimitri, shoot the moon means you're not taking any tricks. Typically, it can so often just mean do something yeah. really difficult in the game that you were rewarded highly, but has a huge risk. But yeah, yeah. in this game, it's in this game it, is, often it is t yeah. take no tricks. Right. Jordan, I think you and I have the same number one. Oh, we do. That's great news. Should we say it at the, say it at the same time? Sure. Right. One, two, three. <laughs> go <laughs> fish. Oh, oh what? It's not go fish. No, go we fish. both have the same number one, which we I love that we have not even mentioned it up until this point in the podcast. So we get to wax poetic about the wonderful Yokai Septet. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what Yokai Septet is? Sure. So Yokai Septet is a team-based trick-taking game. Like Tichu. Like Tichu, right, but a trick-taking game. And <laughs> <laughs> we've all come full circle now. And uh, the goal of the game is to take the, the sevens. Seven, are, sevens are the theme. Sevens are the theme. There are seven suits. Each of the suits has seven cards in it. But the ranks of those suits vary from suit to suit. So one suit starts with an ace and goes up to a seven. That's the lowest suit. And one suit starts with a seven and goes up to a 13. That's the highest suit. And the sevens of each suit are, or each seven is worth a different number of points, right? right. The sevens in the higher suits are, meaning that they're the lowest card in their suit, are worth less, or sorry, are worth more. And the sevens in the lower suits are worth less because they're the highest card in their suit. Right. The harder it is to win with a seven, the more points it's worth. Right, exactly. And the the way a hand plays out is you play a number of tricks until either... Classic trick-taker, must-follow trick-taker. Must-follow trick-taker, right. 
And there will be a trump card. Random. Uh, a random trump yeah, card. Whatever card's not dealt the hand is, is the trump. Right. 49 cards, you know, seven times seven, deal out 48 of them. Last card is the trump. And Four player only, much like Tichu. You can play three, but you it's can. not You're as right. Good. You're right. But it is, I think, typically, you could also play Tichu with three, but it is typically a four player only game. And that's right. one of the difficulties of the, of the partner games, right? Sure. Is that you have to have four and you have to be comfortable with that. Right. That limitation for sure. Um, and so the, the hand ends either when one team has collectively acquired four of the sevens or they've won seven tricks without having acquired four of the sevens. In the case that they've acquired four of the sevens, they score their sevens. In the event that they've acquired seven trips without uh, acquiring four sevens, their opponents win and get all of the sevens in their hands. And so the sevens are worth between zero and two points, essentially, and you play to seven points. Yeah. So simple. Except so for simple. the Trump one, which loses its points. Right, exactly. The, the seven of the Trump suit is worth nothing. Um, this is... This is what I love about this is I, to me, this has the depth of teach you in that uh, the first time I played, I was like, the skill ceiling is so high here. Uh, and I still feel I'm awful at this game. Like I get a hand of cards and, and much like in teach you, you're supposed to give your opponent three cards. Although in teach you, you give one to your opponent, one to your, I mean, we give one, here you give your partner, three you give your partner. Right. And I mean, in teach you, you give one to your opponent and then one to your partner. Mm-hmm. I look, I have no clue how I'm supposed to be giving my cards. I don't even like, am I giving you what information am I giving? If I, if I, I mean, I play it what I feel is like a very basic version of it where if, if I'm giving you um, a card higher than a seven, it means I want you to take my seven with it. And that's as much information as I know how to give. But I feel like the skill ceiling is very high. Um, or if I'm giving you low numbers, I think I think you should think it means that I'm color shedding or suit shedding. Yeah, you're probably avoiding. Right. Yeah. I'm probably trying to get rid of something. There's a lot of different passing conventions. Oh my God. Like if you it, pass two Trumps, it means you have at least two more Trumps. Okay. Oh, so it's people actually have created conventions. I think there are conventions. Well, there should be. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. But also then, yeah, I don't, yeah. Such a high skill ceiling. So simple to teach though. So fast to play. This is also, unlike Teach You, one of those games, uh, partner games, and people love partner games. People love that experience of like, it's me and you, let's take these suckers down. Right. This is, I've, anyone can learn this game. And I don't think it loses any skill ceiling or interactivity because of its simplicity. Right. There's a huge element of deduction in this game based on what's being passed to you and yeah. what's being played. And so you really want to be thinking about who has each of the sevens. Right. And if you know that information, you can make really great plays. I almost feel like this, like I, I always say Agricola is the best game that will make you good at every worker placement game. I kind of feel like this is a trick taking game that will make you good at every trick taking game a little, like it just, it just gives you such a strong, you, you have to, your skills of, of, of card counting, of deducing, of when to lead, when to color shed, when to all, like all, if you get really good at those in this game, I feel like you could apply those to almost any trick taker. This probably is the game for me that has the most headspace. Mm. Very simple teach, but it's so, so hard to get good at. It. Yeah. Uh, and, and that can be appealing to some people. Sure. It can also be like, like stepping off a step and not... Yeah having the step there uh, because it's not obvious except to like really beat your head against the wall of how do, how do you get better at this? Yeah. You really yeah. have to pay attention to your partner. Yeah. You oh, yeah. really it, have to pay attention. You cannot win alone. You can't win alone. Right. You have to pay attention to every card that's been played. Yeah. You have to pay attention to the range of suits. Uh, it, it, it's really complex. It, the demands of being good at it. Yeah. Uh, are not apparent from right, know, the and it's not from necessarily a game. Like Teach You is really fun from play to play. In that, in, you all, like, this is really about putting all the plays together <laughs> into a grand strategy and winning. This isn't like you know, there, this is where Teach You. I think it's fun just to figure out well, what's the best play I can make right now. This is often like. What's the least damaging play I can make right now? Right. <laughs> Something to think about is, are my partner and I actually going to win this hand? Because if right. we're not, I want to throw you the sevens that are worth nothing. Right. Because right. sure, sure. then you, I'll end this hand early, you'll score less, and we have a better chance to come back next round. Right. It's also a great game to get better at because you have a partner who's going to help yeah. you get better by pointing out, hey, that was dumb. Don't do that. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you have someone who's on your side in upgrading your skill this this game had the most uh, exclamations of 
oh man, I just made a terrible mistake right. of any of the games that we we played. And we played a ton of these games recently. I think that had the most uh, schadenfreude, in it. or not, but just like sort of sense of like, oh, that was not right. Or, yeah. or look at you did there. It makes you feel <laughs> really dumb. I love a game that makes me feel really dumb. If I feel like there is a path to getting better. And this, this is one, this is the game that has the highest ceiling of like skill to me. Right. And a much I better game. Say, oh, okay. Go ahead. I would say that based on my limited experience, it's the one that's the least dependent on luck. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, uh, in, in terms of... Well, because the, between you and your partner, you have half the deck. The draws are like the... It, it's about how you play, yeah. not not what you have, at least in my... Uh, well, I would say Nokusu, session. though. Because of the drafting in Nokusu, you, you, you also have this incredible agency to change whatever it is that you think you were you were you had in your hand and uh that to me is also one of the one of the strengths for it but this yeah that's that kiss game is a high ceiling high skill game let me just say before we get too far here uh from 2018 yokai septet the designers are yo and monoyuki yokouchi uh who also designed cat in the box and um yeah wow that's quite a the only thing i my, my only criticism of the game was that i wish it had like maybe one more card a little bit more and I would put it, let's call it like the um, uh, like the wild card or the dragon or something. Mean, there's sort of a dragon in it. It has the A, it, it, the a in it. But right. I thought if it had one more card that did something, mm. uh, that like a dog or something in that in that I would way. typically agree with you. But I, I don't know. I like how simple and clean this one is. Mm. And, but, yeah, but, I, but I also could see that I could get bored of it. Yeah, that's the only thing. Yeah. Is I thought there, there was potentially a little bit of boredom in it. I, I wish it had a phoenix and a dragon <laughs> yeah. and, right. and a birdie. Perfect. And no trick taking. No trick taking. No <laughs> exactly. Right. Could play any amount of cards you wanted. Uh, uh, well, that was our top three, and I, I feel it was a really good. Ex- it's just sort of a, an excuse for us to talk about some really great trick taking games. One thing I wanted to mention, just as another thing, is that um, if you're only two people, I would say to you, my favorite two person game is Fox in the Forest. Oh yes, yes absolutely. Uh, and that game is, and that is an early game in the in this world of like. It was about 2018 or something like that, and uh, in and just thinking of new ways of thinking of these kinds of games. Uh, it's a brilliant game, uh, but two player only. I yeah. think Fox and the Forts and Jekyll and Hyde is another two player yeah. trick taking game. Brilliant. There's a uh, so a, a lot of people say the 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 trick. I sound like Trump, and I'm like a lot of people are saying uh, the the a lot uh, a lot of people seem to agree that the beginnings of this trick taking renaissance was Fox and the Forest and the Crew. Yeah, that were sort of the ones that then have spawned this. You know bringing it to a wider audience. Yeah, Fox in the Forest was 2017. There's also Fox in the Forest Duel. Duet. Duet. Duet, sorry. Not the opposite of (laughs) Duel, which is a co-op version of it. I have both. I didn't really care for Duet, personally. Yeah, Duet's not. um, But, I mean, if if you don't like, if you or your partner do not like conflict, um, it is still a fun trick. Don't play card games. Uh, Well, that's not true. (laughs) Yeah, it's difficult, because I would always play the crew over Fox in the Forest duet, but if you only have two, do you really need a two-player cooperative trick game? Sure, maybe. Um, I would also just say, I'm shocked the crew isn't on my list of top three, and and it probably should be. I think it's a masterpiece. It is. The the sequel, which is called... um, Underwater something. Yeah, Deep uh, Mission Deep Sea, I think is a flawless game. I I, I I agree. I, I think it's a 10. I think it's about as perfect as games get with infinite replayability. So if, if, to me, that's um, a good segue into our next segment is for people who have just listened to this, who would like to know what you think this should be their first game, taking into consideration how hard it is to get some of these. Afterwards, I'm going to talk about how you could actually start acquiring some of these games. But for the most part, what's a good game right now? Somebody just wants to go to Barnes & Noble, go on Amazon, go to their FLGS and pick up a trick taker. That's a good starting point. What do you guys think? I think I think you got it. Scout, I would say, is I taught that to so many non-gamers. Grokked it immediately. It's widely available now. Used to not be. I'd say that one. Okay, Jordan? Maybe Nine Lives. I think Nine yeah. Lives is a good place to start. Cat in the Box is a little more complicated, but maybe more regu- readily available. Yeah, but I, I think Cat in the Box is another... Is another. You have to be into it before you want a completely no. I agree with that. I think it's a. It's. It, I don't know if you if you like it. I don't know if it means you like trick takers. And if you don't like it, I don't know if it means you don't like trick takers. I would mention also one more that you you mentioned very briefly. Five three five is a lovely game that is, and one of the great things about it is that you never feel like you can't play any. Like your all cards are valuable in that game, right. and so you're never really in a situation where you're feeling like, oh, I'm just. 
rotely playing. There is a way of getting rid of some cards, uh, you know, of getting, of getting in fact, cards. I would say that Scout is not necessarily as easy to acquire as you have just stated, because it, it, they do sell out often, and then it's, it, you, they're, the print runs are small and they're gone. Well, Barnes & Noble does still have it. Okay, yeah. but not everybody lives close to a Barnes & Noble. No, I, mean, but I would just say, online, if you yeah. can't find Scout, 535 is a wonderful other option yeah. that will give you a very similar climbing shedding feeling and can be purchased immediately from Portland Game Collective's website. Um, and it's also lovely to support uh, local game designers if you are local to Portland or America. Uh, Dimitri, do you have a, a recommendation for somebody? Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, David said it's Scout. Yeah, um, I, I I think as a first trick taking game, it, it has this really interesting constraint of not ordering your hand. Uh, it, it it has a lot of the shedding. It has a lot of meaty, interesting decisions, but it's fun. The hands are over quickly, uh, and, and and you get dealt a new one. Uh, and and uh, it has so much of what people love about trick takers, yeah. and I love constraints. Yeah. And I, I would just say the crew quest for planet nine, literally something you can get anywhere that sells a game. Um, and I, I, to me, it's along with teach you one of those games that every gamer should own. Um, it, you know, it, it's inexpensive enough to, to just risk the purchase. Uh, it's under 20 bucks. And I, I just think you're gonna, you're gonna have, you're gonna find three other people that, uh, enjoy this with you. Um, and I, I think it's also, I, we didn't talk about it much this episode. I think it's, an, it's something we can be talked about for hours. I think it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. I would just say buy mission deep sea though. Right. I think that's yeah, that, a straight replacement. Oh, yeah. is, what did I, did I say? Planet you said, oh, I think you said, I, I was, yeah, I would buy the second, second one. Yeah. The second yes. one. Yeah. I would buy, I would I, I, the first one's fine. It's just, um, the second one has infinite replayability in, in the way that the deck's constructed. Yeah, and the only the downside mission. to the crew I would say is that it shines when you've played it like almost like a legacy game where you're oh, playing sure. it over many hours and it's getting more complicated. There is a learning curve. Yeah, there and that, but there's curve. something about the way you're just slightly making it more difficult over time that is beautiful in it. But it and, and but in that context then, right, you're not really resetting in some ways. You can. You can go back to the beginning and reset, but you're in, with new people. So there's a little bit of a legacy element to it. Um, yeah. All right, well, let's let's do a little... We, we, we had a wonderful 90 minutes talking about our love for it. Let me just give some people some more resources if they want to go a little deeper than Game Brain can take them on the trick-taking rabbit hole. First of all, the... The, the first place I went after David and Jordan introduced me to uh, Shamans was Taylor's Trick Taking Table, which is a YouTube channel. Um, fantastic channel. Taylor has wonderful uh, a wonderful sense of humor, a wonderful ability to teach games, and a wonderful ability to spread his passion for the hobby. Um, has pretty much reviewed every game that you could imagine and has taught it as well. So I, I spent a lot of time just watching videos there and seeing what I was interested in and making my purchases based on that. And this looks cool. This doesn't look cool. What games that Taylor recommended, things like that. It's just a wonderful, you know, great YouTube channel. Uh, Dads on a Map is another great YouTube channel as well. I think they're a podcast as well. I apologize if I'm wrong on that or right on that. Um, they have done a lot of wonderful live plays uh, on Twitch that I think they then repost on YouTube of their group playing trick takers. Also a wonderful way to watch, uh, and learn, um, and to learn about games you wouldn't have known about. Then there's the trick talkers podcast, which is a podcast about, you guessed it, trick taking, uh, climbers and shedders of which I will be a guest on, uh, I believe next week I'm recording in a couple days. Um, and they were lovely enough to have me on and I've played some online games with them. Um, and they are lovely and a wonderful podcast dedicated entirely to trick taking. Lastly, um, I would recommend the trick taking guild on BGG. Not everybody uses guilds on BGG, but it's there. It's wonderful. It's a good resource. It's a good place to ask for recommendations. And if you can get an invite to the Portland Game Collective Discord, which you could probably do by asking somebody on the BGG Guild, um, that is a wonderful place where I've met a lot of great people and gotten some great help, especially in the next topic, which is the importing world. So how do you get these games that have no US or often European distribution that are only released at the Tokyo game market, which is basically the Essen of Japan, um, where all these games are released. Matt, when, um, when, are we, when are we going to the Tokyo game market? Like tomorrow, I think. <laughs> I think, it, well, it just happened, so we got a little while to wait. But, um, you know, this, is, this, this hobby has not yet found international distribution on a, on a wide scale. Um, so often your only option is to buy from importers who have bought the games in Japan and then brought them to your local area and marked them up and sold them to you. Um, or... 
through literally buying them through Japanese websites and then paying a some sort of a shipping company to figure out how to get it to you. So I'll just give you the quick basics on what to do here. Well, the easiest route is to go to a couple different websites that, at least in America, I know ship, uh, get games from Japan, bring them here, and ship them to you. One of them, which is brand new, which is called trickyimports.com. Tricky Imports is based out of, I believe, a Portland game store. And the person there has some sort of an in in the world of Japanese games and gets these. And when they have copies, they sell them. Did they hire Tom? No, they did not. Uh, they have, I don't know what mules they use, but they have wonderful gaming mules. Uh, you could buy trick takers right now from them with a wonderful bundle for about a hundred bucks, which is cheaper than a flight to Japan. Um, another place to get games is Tanuki Games, A-T-X, T-A-N-U-K-I Games, A-T-X, uh, which I would imagine means they are probably in Austin, Texas. Um, they also have some imported games you can get. There was a site called Big Cat Games, and they've recently announced that they're going out of business because they have, um, I guess, a conflict of interest because they've taken a job working for a trick-taking company at this oh. point. So they don't feel right selling other people's games or something along those lines. But uh, if you're listening now, they may still be online. You could buy some things there, but I've, I've heard they are going out of business. Um, lastly, you can Google search the Japanese name of these games, which you can often find on BGG. So if you go to BGG and, for example, you were to type in uh, a Japanese game, Trick Takers, whatever, you will often see next to it the Japanese version of the title. You could then copy-paste that and Google it, and it will usually take you to a website where you could potentially find it for sale. You then use your browser to translate that, and a lot of these places will have built-in ways of buying them for you, storing them somewhere in Japan until you've decided you've collected enough games and then consolidating them all and shipping them back to you. So the easiest ways to do that, of which I have done quite a few at this point, are booth.jp, buyee, B-U-Y-E-E, or Zen Market. These are all places that will, basically, you tell them what you want, they go buy it, they bring it back to their warehouse, and they'll hold it for free for a certain amount of time, usually 30 days, 60 days. And when you've decided you have accrued all the things you've asked them to accrue for you, much like there's some sort of gaming door dash, they will then tell you how much it will cost to ship it to you and do so usually by air, which means you usually get them in like two days, which is wild and not wildly expensive, not too crazy. Um, also even a lot better, more cost efficient if you find local friends of yours who are also into the hobby and want to go in on getting copies as well. That's a good way to, you can, you can get down your per shipping game cost to, you know, sometimes $5 or so each, which is pretty good and better than usually the shipping cost on local games. Um, so that is sort of, again, I'm just barely dipping my toe into this world, asking more questions on the BGG Guild, the Trick Taking Guild, Portland, Ga Portland Game Collective Discord. But as I said, finding these games is a game in and of itself. And if you like that game, like me, and get into the fun of trying to track down hard to find games, um, I think you will enjoy them. I wanna end by just talking about the uh, some really fun games that I've gotten my hands on that aren't necessarily trick takers or climbers and shedders and that are I think are worth adding to any of your orders from Japan that are really fun as well that may come here eventually. There's a wonderful game called Startups, which Shut Up and Sit Down has talked about before. That is sort of a stock buying game. I think we talked about it in a previous episode. Um, but that game is really awesome. Also by Oint Games can be purchased. Does not fall under the category of trick takers, but it's just a really fun Japanese card game, small box filler. Then there's a game called Nana, which I absolutely adore. Um, the art is by Sai Beppu, who is an incredible artist who has done a ton of amazing games uh, in this genre. And Nana is kind of a memorization card game. We've also talked about it on the podcast before. There's just a whole world of incredible Japanese game designers, and a lot of them work in these small box games. Um, By the way, a good resource for those games I, I recently found is, is a YouTube channel called Board Game East. Mm, okay, yes, yes, yes. I found I've seen that one before. That's great. Yes, uh, um, and he talks. Uh, he's in Taiwan, I believe, but he, and he but he goes to the Tokyo Game Market, uh, and he uh, he is importing games from all over Asia and talking about them. Uh, so just a shout out to him. Yeah. So. Hopefully this is a decent primer for you into the world of, of, of this rabbit hole of trick-taking games and climbers and shutters. I'd like to thank all the people on uh, the Portland Game Collective Discord who have been so kind and helping me, especially Ryan of the uh, Trick Talkers podcast, of which I will be on soon. He's been extremely helpful and uh, kind and sort of taking me under his wing and showing me the ropes in this world. 
And I appreciate that so much. Jordan, yeah. what are the dates of the Portland thing? I believe it's July 15th, the weekend of July 15th. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you live in that area and you can go to that convention, that is the big trick-taking convention, at least in the States. Yeah, get in touch with me. We'll play some play some games together. Candace yeah. is going as well, right? Candace is going as well. Awesome. And Candace is another resource. I mean, and, her, is, and, her, and her podcast where she did that. Yep, yes, she's talked right. about she it a lot. Episode. Candace is, uh, yeah, also like, I, I've yet to play a trick-taking game with Candace, which is funny, <laughs> even though she's like the one who's t- taught you all these amazing things. She's our games. trick-taking guru. She is. And, uh, and and lastly, I will just mention there are even stranger ways you can go in this hobby, such as getting into French tarot decks and playing a wonderful game we played this afternoon called Les Plateaux, which we may do a review on later, so I won't get too deep into it. But does somebody want to just briefly tell us what the hell Les Plateaux was all about? Yeah, it's got this central board with, well, first of all, you play with the French tarot deck, which is a non-traditional deck with four royal cards in it. Well, it's traditional to the French. Traditional to the French, that's right. And and twenty or, or and two twenty-one people trumps. Who use tarot decks to to do, you do div- divination. I think that's a different type of no, tarot deck. No, it's not. There, it in fact is the same one. Especially like if you look at like Sai Beppu's uh, deck, tarot deck, it is actually the same one. It's the same. It's got the fool. It's got uh, death. They it's just got all those emphasize things. Emphasize like. Because our Trumps just said one through thir- one through twenty, right? But Their if you Trumps look at the like other one, yeah, and- yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. I'll, I'll show you afterwards. That one actually has all the normal things you would see in like a tarot thing. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyways, those the the royals and uh, Trumps one through six are on the central board, and essentially you play a trick. And when you, I'm doing a terrible job of explaining this. There's a bid at the front end, yeah, wherein you're saying how many sides of this he- hexagonal board that has those cards on its various spaces, you'll be able to connect. And you can either bid on your own, you can bid with a teammate, you can bid with two teammates if you're playing with six players. Then you play the hand. Whoever wins the trick gets, it, you know, every card that's on the board that's in the trick, they get to put a marker on, and they're trying to connect these various sides. And I think that's... Yeah, you're, you're it, creating right? patterns. You're, it's a little, not area majority, but it's route building to a certain extent, and you're doing it by collecting tricks. See, look, see, I'm showing Jordan that all yes. of the trump cards are actually sort of the classic tarot card decks. So what is the 21? 20 is judgment. What is the 21? Maybe death, Jordan. I don't oh, know. Do you death. really want to find out? I think we should take everyone's time. And we should look through all, every single card in that <laughs> deck that, to find the yeah, one. I had a tarot similar. reading yesterday. A friend of mine does 20. these. Uh, and it was very fun. I highly recommend getting a tarot reading. Don't pay for it. But uh, if you have a friend who's into it, it's very fun. Yeah. Uh, I, Don't I had patronize the... professional tarot draw. <laughs> <laughs> only, only, only make to your be own and yeah. learn it yourself. <laughs> uh, t- Twenty-one, by the way, is the world. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. It was. It was. It was very good. I'm. That, that, I really want to play that. What's that, more, Stephen yeah. Wright? There's a Stephen Wright joke about this. I was playing poker last night with a tarot deck. Good news is I won. Bad news is three people died or something. <laughs> it's a good joke. It's a good joke. Yeah, I'll definitely be putting an order to, for that before this episode releases. So yes. that I'll get a copy before. Yeah, you have to. Out, yeah. Um, well, I think that's it. Does anybody else want to talk about anything? Did I leave anything out in our trick oh, world I, extravaganza? I, I want to add a couple of games that I think we all enjoyed. Uh, uh, Voodoo Prince and Ghosts of Christmas. I, I, yeah. I'm looking forward to playing both of them again. I, I think everyone agrees. Voodoo here. Prince is from um, young up-and-coming designer Reiner Knizia. Uh, <laughs> but Voodoo Prince is an awesome, um, what is referred to as, uh, oh, geez, I have to pull my notes back up here. Um, uh, this is referred to as trick avoidance, where you are trying not to win so many tricks because it has this really fun me- mechanic where um, you want to win... Uh, you want to not be the first to 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 go out, but you don't want to be the last either, and you get points by how many people are still in. Really fun. Really cool. Stick'em um, is another fun one that we've played a few times. Stick'em is it's really fun good. also, yeah. Um, so anyway, thank you so much, guys, for joining me. David, thank you for finally coming on the podcast. You know, it, it was it was only the promise of uh, getting free um, uh, trick-taking games that I can. Yes. Well, and thank you, David, for 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 you know being so persistent in your love for for this genre and bringing games forever to the point where I finally caved and tried them. And Jordan, who uh, also uh, you know there was there was definitely safety in numbers there, and I was happy to finally give in and succumb to the power of trick takers. And for Dimitri for always being a champion of Tichu and keeping it. Uh, around in our game group, so we're always playing. Oh, oh no, the, you, you guys play uh, keep away with it. Uh, basically, 
uh, game brain has not played to teach you deliberately no. to, to well to and we have a thing work. where anytime you're not there and we have four people we send you a picture of us playing uh, in fact you talk about japan uh when i was in japan last time uh with uh paul and and uh trey uh, trey and and, and matt that wasn't you david too <laughs> uh, we played to teach you on the steps of a temple in near Tokyo, yes. and then we sent the uh, we texted the photo to Dimitri to make him jealous. <laughs> you larping as Tom for this whole episode is, is 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 breaking my brain in the way that I think some of these trick takers broke your brain. <laughs> um, oh, my brain is broken. Uh, all right, well that's it, everybody. We will see you on the next episode. You've been listening to Game Brain, produced and edited by Matthew Robinson, Tom Donnelly, Trey Alsop, and Ben Mandelker. Special thanks to Daedalus for our incredible music. More on Daedalus at GameBrainPod.com. You can reach us by email at contact at GameBrainPod.com. Thanks for listening, and go play some games with friends, or make some friends with games. With games.